give me a call at 413-214-1237 as well. Before we start tonight, I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Frontier Natural Products, Lancaster Agriculture, and UMass Risk Management Crop Insurance Education Program for supporting the production of this series. I'd also like to thank New Entry Sustainable Farming Project and the Tufts Friedman School of Nutritional Science and Policy for providing access to the WebEx software we are using to host tonight's workshop. Also, and lastly, many thanks to all the NOFA Mass and staff and board who always help and assist to make these workshops possible. And if you're not a member of NOFA Mass, I really encourage you to become a, a member. Um, members get uh, a chance to support our education and policy work. Uh, visit our website to get more information, and don't forget the winter conference is coming up in January 2019. So tonight's presenters, and I'm very excited about this, but our presenters tonight are Ms. Elizabeth Henderson and Mr. Lou Badalin of NOFA's Domestic Fair Trade Committee. And our format tonight will be a little different as they will uh, talk about the Domestic Fair Trade Committee, and at certain points you get a chance to send in your questions. Uh, you can either email them I'm sorry, you can either uh, type them in the chat feature, which is at the top portion of your control, or you can text them to me directly at 413-214-1237. And if everyone has a chance, if you can um, use that chat feature, just type in your name, where you're from, and if there's other people that are watching or even listening to this um, presentation tonight with you, it would be great to know how many folks are reaching tonight. Um, so without any further ado, because I'm very excited to uh, hear this presentation, I will turn things over to Elizabeth and Lou. Good evening, everybody. It's Elizabeth Henderson, um, and let's see if we can get um, my screen up. There we go. There it is. Can you all see that? So we're going to talk about our Domestic Fair Trade Committee, and first a few words about Domestic Fair Trade. Um, with the growing interest in ethical buying from consumers, ethical claims have multiplied really quickly in the marketplace, so there are many, many different labels, and they don't all mean fair in the same way. Um, Fairness is one of the basic principles of organic agriculture, and what I'm showing you here is part of the principle of fairness, but it's really a basic um, underlying concept of everything in organic agriculture, that we're trying to be fair to the environment, to one another, to people, to animals, to all of the critters, and through respect and careful stewardship by enabling all of all living things to achieve the kind of life that is most natural and beneficial to them. But when so many different <coughs> fair trade labels started appearing in the marketplace, um, NOFA became involved with a bunch of other organizations in founding a domestic fair trade association. The other founders include Equal Exchange, which you probably all know from coffee and bananas and chocolate, um, Organic Valley, the farmer co-op, uh, Farmer Direct Co-op, <coughs> which is a Canadian co-op that does grains and beans in Canada, Rural Advancement Foundation USA, and NOFA. And we formed a steering committee and started actually meeting officially in 2007. And those first meetings were kind of hairy because it was already icy in Lafarge and a bunch of the other people going were Southerners. So I had to do a lot of the driving. But the Domestic Fair Trade Association is an attempt to cross sectors in the food system to bring together farmers, farm workers, people in retail, processing, manufacturing, and not-for-profits 
that are concerned about just and sustainable food. And to work across the sector, but to work in consensus, building um, those positions on things that we could all agree, agree upon to create fair trade domestically in the United States. As it's been my experience as a farmer here that farmers in the U.S. and farm workers especially are every much in need of fair trade as farmers in developing countries. So the Domestic Fair Trade Association developed 16 principles. And you can read the list here, but if you go to <clears throat> domestic DF, the DFTA.org, you will find each of these principles spelled out in much greater detail. And to become a member, each organization has to evaluate its own practices in relation to each of these principles. So Bill Dusing, who just passed away and who was the pre president of our NOFA Interstate Council for many years, and I together filled out the application to the DFTA on behalf of NOFA. NOFA does really well in terms of some of these principles, but there are other principles in which we have a great deal of work yet to do. And based on the work with the Domestic Fair Trade Association, I initiated a subcommittee of the NOFA Interstate Policy Committee to work on domestic fair trade and to find other people besides me who could represent NOFA um, as members of the Domestic Fair Trade Association. And so it's a, it's a subcommittee that's open to any NOFA member in any state. We have members from Massachusetts, um, New Hampshire, New York, and New Jersey, and we'd love to have members from the other state chapters as well. So we're hoping other people will join us. What this committee has done um, over the five or six years that we've been in existence is um, to, <clears throat> First of all, focus on increasing NOFA chapters' attention to the issues of domestic fair trade. And those issues include fair pricing for farmers, better conditions and pay for farm workers, social justice, equity, racial and ethnic diversity within NOFA. And we've served as NOFA representatives to the Domestic Fair Trade Association, attending their annual meetings, and then reported on those meetings in the natural farmer. And some of us state chapters have already also picked up our reports on their websites or their e-news. And we regularly report to the Interstate Council and the Interstate Policy Committee uh, about developments within the Domestic Fair Trade Association and with the Agricultural Justice Project, of which NOFA is also a founding member. And each year, the NOFA Domestic Fair Trade Committee sets up a list of activities that will support our mission, and you can read the mission here to serve as an incubator and encourage the development of domestic fair trade within NOFA. Um, so we set up an agenda for the year of things that we're going to try to do. Um, we usually uh, include attending the NOFA Interstate Council Retreat organize a summer gathering on domestic fair trade at the summer conference, and then working with chapters to encourage them to include domestic fair trade topics in winter conferences. And we've circulated a list of possible topics for all of the conferences that relate to domestic fair trade. And then uh, Lou and I have given a lot of workshops at winter conferences over the past few years. So, um, the summer conference gatherings um, bring together farm workers, farmers, food system workers, the same range of different categories across sector that belong to the Domestic Fair Trade Association, but people from the Northeast. And over these four years, we've really um, made some progress in developing a Northeast network of people who are concerned with these issues who come 
every year and bring one another up to date on what's going on. And at our last meeting this summer, people were hoping that maybe we could find a second venue sometime halfway through the year so that we could meet more frequently. And now I think I will turn the uh, microphone over to Lou, and he will talk about um, some of the additional work of the Domestic Fair Trade Association of, uh, I'm sorry, of our Domestic Fair Trade Committee. Lou, take it away. Lou, are you there? Are you on on mute? Because I don't hear you. And can I you can, hear me now? I can hear you now. There you are. Oh, okay. Alan, and I and I live in uh, Western Massachusetts. Can you hear me okay? Yes, hear you fine now. Okay, and hope everybody else can as well. Um, and uh, it was through uh, Liz's efforts that I uh, became involved on the on the Domestic Fair Trade Committee, and have had an opportunity to um, to do some traveling and go to some of the uh, Domestic Fair Trade Association's annual meetings, and get a sense of what else is happening nationally on the uh, domestic fair trade landscape. And um, that kind of activity um, has served me well, I think, in terms of understanding what is happening here in the Northeast and, and potentially what could happen here and, and what are some of the differences uh, in, in our area. Uh, most specifically, I think, is the, um, the strength of the organic movement and um, the size of farms. And uh, farms out here are, are uh, much smaller and than, than in the nation, and um, we tend not to uh, have as many farm workers on most of the operations. And these kinds of um, singularities have uh, affected uh, the kinds of activities that Liz and I have chosen to do uh, in the last few years. So uh, right away, when after about a year or so since I joined, about five years ago now, um, we, co we commissioned a graduate student, Becca Berkey, to help us um, conduct a survey of the, of the uh, farmers in the NOFA network. And we wanted to get a sense from them about what kind of um, justice-related issues impact them and what their social justice values are. And uh, we also wanted to get a sense of how an organization like NOFA can help address these issues and support them in, um, de in dealing with these, these issues. And uh, in addition to the uh, NOFA states, we also got some uh, response from uh, farmers in uh, Maine and in Pennsylvania. And uh, if you want to put up the value rankings uh, slide, Liz, do you have that up? Um. Okay. Right. So, um, one of the one of the uh, questions that we asked of farmers was to um, rate rate their uh, values um, uh, relative to social concerns, and um, these are. Uh, and there was about 18 that, that, that proved significant. And these are five of the, that you see here are five of the top 10 that they listed. And uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you notice, these are all uh, related to domestic fair trade issues and the domestic fair trade association principles that uh, Liz had shown us on a previous slide. Uh, th these also are, are values that um, are concerns in the Agricultural Justice Project's uh, food certification standard that uh, I'm going to be talking about shortly. Um, the survey also um, shed some light on, uh, on some emergent themes, uh, specifically uh, 
what's the how do we create a context for justice and fairness and uh and and what are the challenges in 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 creating such an atmosphere and we found that um the constraints in being able to adequately address and implement these values tended to focus on uh, limitations of resources, money and time, and uh, or the lack thereof, and, and similarly, what kind of support there would be in the marketplace, both at the retail level and, and with consumers. And uh, fo following uh, those uh, survey, uh, we've tried to identify then what could NOFA best do to assist farmers in, in moving forward? What, what, are, what is NOFA's particular strengths and how can we best apply them here? And uh, we felt it was important, firstly, to uh, revisit and, in a sense, um, rearticulate our shared set of values. And, 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 and from there, maybe develop some strategies for bringing uh, the different stakeholders together and particularly honoring the, their presence and, and their subsequent uh, participation. And um, we've done that through a number of workshops and roundtables, um, including uh, looking at balancing fair wages and farm viability and affordable prices, um, having a workshops on understanding fair trade label, labels, uh, balancing uh, fair prices and fair wages, uh, and supporting in that context farmers and farm workers alike. And, uh, for example, this past year at the NOFA Vermont Winter Conference, Liz and I conducted a roundtable discussion on achieving a living wage for farmers and farm workers. And uh, so these, are, these were, and that was uh, extremely well attended uh, and heavily attended by farmers, which was, which was quite exciting. People who have their own challenges in meeting li their own living wages, n never mind trying to... Uh, you know, express uh, how they can uh, not only address the needs of their farm workers, but but um, achieve something that um, will keep the uh, farm workers' uh, retention rate high, because that's clearly uh, one of the concerns among the uh, farmers that we surveyed a number of years ago. Um, it seems that the main motivation for many organic farmers in the NOFA network um, relates to environmental sustainability and an understanding of the better health of organic production, and perhaps less to drawing a premium within the market and or solidarity with workers. But um, they also uh, look to uh, NOFA network for technical assistance and for networking with other organic farmers because um, there aren't similar associations. So that was, um, so having these workshops and roundtables has been one way of um, utilizing the information that was in the survey. And then the second, the second piece I um, want to share um, is a second project uh, that we did was create these guidelines um, for workshop presenters, um, which you can see here. Um, and and um, there's, about, uh, there's about 10 or 12 of them that we thought we would like uh, workshop presenters to be thinking about when they craft and present workshops and roundtables. Well, how they use their language in particular, how, they, how, how do we respect other people in the room, how do we welcome other voices in the room and who are in the room. And um, so we, sh we have shared these with the, with the different state chapters. Um, some of the chapters have used them um, in, in, in different manifestations. And um, we c that continues to be a work in progress. Uh, we, we haven't been able to um, analyze how, how, how well this has uh, succeeded, if it succeeded, if it has succeeded at all. We don't know that. Well, um, we do know that. NOFA workshop, NOFA conferences are having more workshops on domestic fair trade topics. All of the yes. winter conferences, the summer conferences as well. Yes, and and we do know that this past summer we we um, had our own uh, nascent uh, workshop on whether um, NOFA should have a social justice committee. And um, so there's beginning to become a a forum 
for a discussion of these ideas. What, what does fairness mean in, in, NOFA, in the NOFA world? What does food justice uh, look like? How do we turn to others um, who might be interested in organics? What could we offer to them? And what could we learn from them? And um, we we're finding this very exciting. The, um, the next slide um, is uh, about a new project that um, a, uh, the AJP is the Agricultural Justice Project. It had four founding members, of which uh, NOFA is one of them and is still a, an active member. And Liz serves as NOFA's uh, board member on AJP. And uh, we've been doing some specific work uh, in the last year or two up here in the Northeast. Uh, and we conducted a training this past spring um, to familiarize uh, some farm worker organizations and to um, have some auditors be able to conduct a food justice cert uh, standard certification under the AJP label. And, and now this year, we're going to be um, increasing our, our efforts and our energy and uh, sp on a two-pronged approach, um, most specifically and grandly, we'll be working with, with farmers to help them uh, assess what their uh, social justice standards are, what their values are, if they implement them, and how they could implement them, and if they would like assistance from AJP, in, uh, in doing so if they chose to have this as a practice. And um, this is going to help NOFA as well because we'll be able to identify some needs among the NOFA farmers and um, maybe we could, uh, NOFA could then be able to uh, provide appropriate workshops and technical assistance based on the results of this survey. And uh, we're looking for 50 farms across um, the seven states to fill out a very brief um, assessment, and, and these are some of the areas that are covered. Uh, one is, is working with, with uh, the growers working with their buyers. Another one is covering the labor rights of employees. That includes um, interns. If you could go back to the other one, please, Liz. That includes the interns and apprentices. Uh, the the, the uh, standards also look at the child labor, at wages, and in housing. Uh, health and safety on the farm, and labor rights. So, for example, on, on the next slide, you'll see that the um, Liz and I uh, are new to this um, dub, uh, dual webinar, so we thank you for your patience in our um, moving forward through these slides. And I'm not very good sometimes at making slides. And, and this is our <laughs> first, this is our dry run. So uh, we might need a little uh, wetness here. Um, so, for example, among the dozen or so questions that deal with uh, how farmers have relations with um, their buyers are, are these kinds of questions. How do you negotiate with your buyers? Um, what are the risks involved? Are the risks shared? Do you have written or verbal contracts? Qu questions questions uh, ranging uh, across a, a wide breadth of uh, concerns. and. Um, we're trying to, trying to get uh, farmers also to think about not only what they do um, and, and, if, and if their practices uh, resonate with what they think are social justice concerns, but, but what other practices um, are reflective of social justice concerns and that they might uh, in the future be considering out of respect for their workers, out of respect for their own operation, and out of respect for um, the customer who, who cares greatly, as we know, through a number of, of uh, studies, more and more about uh, the rights of farm workers and concerns about where their food comes from, and not just the uh, quality of the food itself, but the uh, other practices that go into getting the food to, the, to our table. And, and here's a list of some of the uh, labor rights that, that, that uh, the AJP uh, standard uh, pays attention to. Um, it also pays attention to things like about peace rates, which, which is not listed here. And um, it, go, it, it goes, um, there's about 
16 or so labor rights and 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 here and and including discrimination um including uh changes in employment agreements and 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 uh, it has a wide breadth of 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 considerations and uh we hope then as uh, the second stage of this uh project will be then to identify about 15 or 20 of these farms who who will then uh complete uh the entire uh standard uh program and then we hope to um conduct some mock audits on about five or six of these farms and and welcome the other farmers to to join us to see what it would what what a uh, social justice certified farm looks like and um one of the unique and singular uh components of this standard is that uh not only you know m much of the standards are based on organics in terms of production and and, and growing uh the food the commodities but um a, a second uh, auditor also um uh, appears on the ins inspection and um to talk to the workers and th and this is an individual who's a representative of a workers rep uh, an organization who comes and speaks to the workers uh, if necessary, in their in the, and at all times in their language, and so a, a a different kind of rapport is developed by having a, re, a worker representative come, and uh, and then the two auditors get together and and share their notes uh, during the process of uh, an operation becoming uh, certified. So is that the last? I believe that's the last side of this section. Is that correct, Liz? That is. Yes. So now we're going to talk or, or about the. That people have them right now. About yeah. these things. Is there any right. questions right away? Or we could go on. Well, let's take some questions if there are comments. Are there any? Oh, uh, no. yes. <laughs> uh, we do have one or two questions that came from uh, text. Uh, people who are listening via phone and they text in a few questions if you want to take those now. Sure. sure. Thanks, okay. Anna. So uh, going back to your intro slides on how the Domestic Fair Trade uh, Committee was actually started, what was the inspiration of creating the committee? Why, um, why did um, it come about? What was the impetus for it? Well, I... I was the one who got it started, and it seemed to me that a lot of the values that are um, characteristic of domestic fair trade are values that are shared by many people in Newfoundland, as Mr. Gilman likes to call it. Um, and so there might be more people who wanted to work on it. And by forming a committee, this is a way of making, you know, creating a an instrument for doing that together and finding things that we could work on. Okay, very good. Um, and if, if I may, if I may su sure, supplement please. that that response, mm -hmm. please. Uh, it was also a realization of um, taking a look at the international fair trade movement and the landscape there, and uh, recognizing that um, some of the concerns and the principles. Um, were appropriate in the United, here in the United States, and that um, coming bringing the various stakeholders together was a way of strengthening uh, a segment of the, of the food movement and of um, of honoring um, small producers uh, worldwide, and as a way to support them to. Um, have a niche in the marketplace and and on the supermarket shelves. And what makes it and to support and to support trade. farmers, both local uh, domestically and worldwide. What makes the domestic fair trade approach attractive is that it's multi-sector, because there aren't very many opportunities for farmers and farmers, people who are selling their food and people who are manufacturing their food into something else, to talk with one another and to share values. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, another question that came through um, concerning 
Lou, you mentioned that in the Northeast you don't have large farms with many farm workers. Um, on average, what is the average amount of farm workers that's on any given farm in the Northeast? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um. Well, in the NOVA um, chapters, amongst our members, let's see, I guess this is the one that shows better. Um, the number of workers as a whole are small. So most of the work is done by family members, and then um, there are paid employees. And there are relatively few uh, farms that have large numbers of employees. There are a handful of farms that hire H-2A workers, so that's what this category is. And there are a handful of farms, mainly dairy farms, who are hiring migrant workers or immigrant workers. I don't think anyone has done that kind of careful study of the um, demographics of organic farms in the Northeast. The agricultural census does not ask all the questions that we would like them to ask, which is why we did a survey ourselves. And why we're doing this additional survey based on, um, as a self-assessment, based on the Agricultural Justice Project standards to help farmers think about where they fit in. Okay. Uh, there was a question that came in about the workshop guidelines that you provide for presenters to make sure that there's equity within the different workshops that NOFA puts on. How is that information disseminated to the presenters, whether it be the winter conference, which we know each state holds, or the summer conference? Um, that's done on the, um, the, the uh, conference uh, websites. And, um, Some of the conferences there's, there's actually send that information to all the presenters or people even who are applying to be presenters. Some of the chapters don't share it or, or just have it on their website so that people have to go and find it. Um, no for New York sends it out to all of the presenters. Okay. All right. Well, that's all we have for right now in terms of questions. Um, I'm sure we can anticipate some more. Okay, great. Well, over these years that we've had the Domestic Fair Trade Committee, there's also been other activities um, that have gained more momentum in NOFA land, people working on food access and people who are excited about um, food sovereignty and really all of these areas have a tremendous amount of overlap in terms of values and the activities that flow from those values or that, or that are built on top of them. And so we decided to see if there were enough different NOFA members who would like to expand the Domestic Fair Trade Committee. And we invited them to a seed and grow workshop at this summer conference. And here you see the, the workshop objective to determine whether there's interest in expanding or continuing the present domestic fair trade committee. And then to get people's ideas about what we should be doing. So we had a nicely attended workshop at the summer conference. And we sorted the recommendations that people made into internal, that is, things that NOFA could do, and then external, things that NOFA could do in relation to other organizations or consumers of the outside world. So internally, um, we thought we might give another try at guidelines for workshop presenters, um, offer training for um, workshop presenters to help people hone their skills and to better cover a wider range of interrelated topics when they talk about something. Like if you're talking about a food hub and making the hub work better, 
to also talk about what kind of jobs that hub is going to provide. Are those going to be living wage jobs? Is there going to be um, an attempt to reach out to a broader range of people to get the jobs in that food hub? Um, in Massachusetts, NOFA, there is an inclusion committee. So it was suggested that we use that as an example for all the state chapters. And there were quite a few youth in this workshop, and so a lot of the internal and external recommendations relate to work that NOFA could be doing with youth, either by um, having more young people developing the program for the conferences or leading workshops or taking NOFA material to schools, arranging for tours of farms and gardens for school children, things like that. And when I think about it, in New York State, um, in every city in New York, there are school programs teaching you to grow food and learning more about nutrition. And all those school gardens are organic. So I see all of the youngsters who are taking those classes as possible future members and leaders of NOFA. And we have to find ways to connect with them. So externally, the suggestions were um, NOFA talking to other groups, being a resource for other groups as a kind of speakers bureau, um, offering classes for teachers so that teachers could then pass that information on to the people who study with them. Um, there was a strong sentiment that we shouldn't assume that just because we know something that other people know them, knows all of those things. Uh, and uh, Anna um, got a certain amount of razzing of having not known how a cauliflower grew. But you know, when I started growing food and I gave my mother uh, lettuce fresh out of my uh, out of my field, she looked at it and said to me, "Why is your lettuce so dirty?" <laughs> and it just had never occurred to her in 70 years of eating lettuce that lettuces grow on dirt and that someone has washed that lettuce before she even sees it in the store. Um, and then more discussion about engaging the next generation. Um, and one of the things that um, there was a very serious um, discussion about doing is developing a social outreach strategy for the NOFAs to have a conversation around that. And several people who attended that workshop volunteered to be on a, a committee to develop this outreach strategy. So I think that that is something that we really have to work on doing over this next year, bridging the gap between NOFA farmers and school teachers and children, people in the country, people in the city, finding ways to expand and to bring our message to more people um, who really need to hear from us. So the next meeting of this committee will be on Wednesday, September 5th at 6.30 p.m. On this slide, you can see the email for Lewis, lewis at topoftheforest.com, and my email, elizabethhenderson13 at gmail.com. If you would like to get the agenda and the phone number to call for this next Seed and Grow meeting, please let one of us know, and we'd be happy to share all that with you. And so now we'll stop again and have questions and discussion. Sure. Uh, very exciting work that's taking place, particularly with the Seed and Grow uh, workshop. I had a chance to participate in that. And one question that came in, is this a group, and you mentioned that there will be another um, conference call coming up, but is this a group that will continue to work, and eventually do you see it kind of tying into the Domestic Fair Trade Committee? That's too soon to say, in my opinion. Um, it depends on, on, on who wants to uh, step up and become involved and, and the concerns that uh, each of us has. Um, We'll probably um, 
try and, and, and have committee conversations at the uh, respective state winter conferences to, uh, to get out in the hinterland, so to speak, and, and to uh, offer uh, further uh, opportunities for conversation. Um, and I think we'll, we're going to see what happens. And we're going to see what the capacity is of the people who uh, want to step up. And, uh, you know, this is all volunteer efforts. So um, it takes a certain amount of commitment among us to, uh, to be steadfast and uh, um, go, go, for, go for a period of time with this. And so th I think that remains to be seen. And Liz can probably certainly has a, 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 a different pers additional perspective. Well, no, I agree. I, I would like to see um, who's willing to put in some time and do some work on this. Um, I think it's very exciting that people are, that NOFA has become a member of the National Family Farm Coalition and the Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, so we're branching out in different directions, but it's important to see which of our members really want to work on these kinds of issues. Right. We had, we had a great presentation at the summer conference on understanding capitalism better. Several of our chapters have had trainings for staff on understanding racism and dismantling racism in the food system and in our organizations. So there's a lot of ferment and excitement going on around these issues. And we'll just have to see where we go with all this. And Liz and Lou, this is uh, more of a logistical question from uh, Callie Alexander. Wanting to know, are uh, the slides that you put up, which are very informative, can you send a copy of those out? Yes. I'm sorry, of what? Yes, we can send copies of, of, the, sli of, of, the, of the slides mm -hmm. to anybody who requests them. Okay. And should they email you directly or... What they could do that. Way? Okay. They could do that. Whatever you, whatever you uh, works for the webinar, Anna. Okay. Very good. Very good. You can actually, um, if there is anyone viewing or listening, um, if you would like a copy of these um, slides, you can email me directly again at Anna at nofamass.org, or uh, just text me at four one three two one four one two three seven. And just say, may I um, please send me a copy of the slides from the webinar, and we'll get those right out to you. I would just need your email address. So, thank you so much for that. Um, my last question that came in um, for this round is back to the Agriculture Justice Project. If, um, how do you get farms to participate? Can they opt to participate? What is the best way for a farm to do this? Well, um, we're going to have this, um, that's a great question. We're going to have this, uh, uh, the form and the assessment form of a benchmark checklist uh, online at the Agricultural Justice Project's uh, website um, within a few weeks. Um, this is, we've only just begun. We've also reached out to the, um, to the respective uh, seven NOFA state chapters uh, in hopes to garner some uh, uh, support in terms of doing the initial outreach, identifying farms that uh, are, uh, might be receptive to uh, our interests. Um, yeah, so you know, we, farms at least will fill out our benchmark assessment. Yeah, um, we hope to have a, a breadth of farms, uh, not just uh, uh, vegetables, but, but dairy uh, spread across the various states. Um, Different sizes. Urban farms uh, as well as rural. Exactly. But um, you're welcome to reach out to, to, to Liz or myself uh, if if you if you're a farmer and you want to be in, uh, we want to get uh, access to the uh, checklist, or if you want to forward it to, to a farmer that you know, who you or whom you think would like to uh, or needs to take a look at this. If a farm is interested in Agricultural Justice Project certification for the Food Justice Certified Label, 
Um, the first thing to do is to read the standards, and those are available on the agriculturaljusticeproject.org website. Um, the standards are available in both English and Spanish. And then um, on that website, there is also a toolkit of materials that a farm can use. So if your farm already has good labor policies, but you don't have anything written down, um, the Agricultural Justice Project can provide you with technical assistance and templates that you can use to quickly develop written policies of your own, and also a, a PowerPoint you know, slide, slides that you can use in training your staff in the principles of uh, the Agricultural Justice Project. Let me emphasize that although AJP has a, has a unique standard and is and and is very proud and deservedly proud of it and of the high bar that it sets um it, it, it um i i have found that AJP is also proud uh proudly willing to support farmers who uh are not ready to commit to to um being certified but want to be as as Liz said uh begin to be thinking about how to um, hold up to these values, and 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 how to implement them on any, on any level, and 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 this is where we have to uh, start the conversation and the process, and uh, beginning to transform a system. Um, you know, we we could jump right through. Uh, it's not happening. So, we're availing ourselves, particularly through this project, of saying, well, how can we help? This is how we can help. This is this is the way we can help, and um, identifying the farms that have an interest in social justice concerns, and um, and seeing what we can do to assist farmers um, in um, de developing and, and honoring those interests that they have. There is not a lot of market pull for improved labor policies, and there aren't in international fair trade. It's usually the case that the international buyer will pay for the fair trade and organic certification of the many small farms that they buy from. But there aren't buyers in the United States who are willing to pay for domestic fair trade certification or organic trade certification for the farms that they buy from. Um, so we understand that. You know, farmers don't need more paperwork if they can get away with doing less of it. Um, but the technical assistance from AJP makes that paperwork easier, and we're happy for any improvement that a farm can make in terms of their fairness and labor policies or their skills in calculating what their price needs to be so that they can get a price that fully covers their cost of production. And in that regard, our second. Just one last sentence. Um, There's also um, information in our toolkit about what a fair contract is and how to get a fairer contract than what you may be getting. And in that regard, and uh, this is something that also reflects on bringing in different voices and different stakeholders, the second uh, prong of our project is uh, working with food cooperatives where many of the farmers uh, sell their, 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 their commodities to and seeing if we can uh, strengthen the relations between um, participating farmers and food cooperatives who also share many of these social justice values. And um, we're going to see if, if, if we can uh, strengthen that relationship and, and, and build on that. Good. Now, in our last 10 minutes together, um, was there any additional information that you wanted to um, give out to our viewers and listeners tonight? And if there's any additional questions from our viewers and listeners, please feel free to send that in. Um, in term, but if there were any closing comments or additional information that you wanted to share. Well, I just well Anna, can, can, Anna can we find, 
Anna, can we find out if any of the participants um, are, are considering being on our call next week with the Seed and Grow uh, phone call? Is that is that possible to find that out now? Sure. So if anyone um, would like to participate, if you want to send that in the chat feature or uh, text that to me, the ones that are online now, you can put that in the chat feature. If you would like to participate in the call, just give us your email. Um, Yes, give us your email, and that way we can get that information to Elizabeth and Lou and get you the information to dial in. Thanks, Anna. No worries. No worries. Um, I just wanted to encourage people to feel that there's space for them to take this in the direction of things that they're feeling excited about. And I also wanted mm -hmm. to mention that um, I've been NOFA's representative to the Agricultural Justice Project, and I would love to train one or two people to be my backups in doing that work. So if there's anyone who would like to be like my alternate on the Agricultural Justice Project board, I would welcome that. Mm -hmm. Please let me know. Yes, and uh, we did get a taker for the call, uh, Callie Alexander. Great. Email goatwell1 at gmail.com. Uh, we'll also send this to you. Uh, we'll also email that information to you. But, Callie, we look forward to having you on that call. Um, yes, we do. The last question that came in, um, and I think we can probably, as they say in music, take it home on this one, going back <laughs> to the Agriculture Justice Project, concerning the audit. Um, there's no such thing here with this audit as a good audit or a bad audit. What does that look like? What's the end result? What are some of the features of that? Do you want to do that, Lou, or you want me to? Well, I'll, uh, for in, per, in, um, in terms of just the project, um, we were envisioning um, this would be a mock audit that wouldn't be an, an actual one, but we would have both of the two auditors um, go through the steps of what it would look like when um, to, to conduct an actual uh, audit. And um, but this this would be uh, and we would hope to be able to open it up, which may be challenging, uh, so that when the auditor questions the uh, staff. Um, we can learn what that looks like, what that process uh, in, in, uh, entails, and what kind of questions are asked and, and what kind of concerns are brought up so that um, farmers can get a, uh, an uh, underground sense of, of what this means and um, pull back from some of the fear that, that might be there about, you know, exposing oneself to, to um, this kind of perhaps intrusion. Um, when we so place, there are two auditors, and one is from a certification program, and that person um, interviews the farmer or the farm manager or the supervisory personnel, if there, if there is any, and asks about what the labor policies are on the farm and also what the pricing and the marketing situation is for the farm. The second auditor is from a farm worker organization, and that auditor interviews people who work on the farm separate from management and in confidence, asking them questions about whether the farm is really walking its talk. Okay. So it sounds like a, a pretty in-depth pro uh, process working its way to certification. Looks similar to uh, an organic inspection, ah. except that social issues are not just the kinds of things that you can check off. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, well, there's a bag of pesticides or there is no bag of pesticides. There is much more sensitivity involved and um, care must be taken that people aren't offended or that, you know, someone 
the worker reveals something that isn't going well at a farm, that the source of that information isn't revealed so that they are not um, retaliated against in any way. And the same is true, you know, on a farm when you're inspecting a, a store that buys from a food justice certified farm. And the, the store is inspected to find out if they are concerned about whether the farm is getting prices that cover their full costs of production. And then um, an examination of their records to see that they are um, treating the farm fairly, that they don't end the contract with the farm without having a really fair reason for doing that, parallel to the kind of standards that um, we have for farmers in relation to the people who work on their farm or for store in relation to the people who work in the store. Okay. So in the last four minutes, I'll give you both the last words for closing comments. Uh, this is such a, a, a wonderful uh, webinar. It's nice to have webinars that really speak about um, the heart of organic farming and making it accessible, making it fair, making it just. And I do commend you both for the hard work that you've put in on this. So any closing comments uh, before we wrap up for tonight? Uh, I would just like to thank you, Anna, for, for, for um, offering us this opportunity and uh, for um, recently working with you on um, some of these uh, issues and uh, wanting to welcome anybody listening to, uh, to present yourself. And uh, we'd like to listen to what you want to engage in uh, in trying to uh, work toward a system where we feel righteous and act so. I think we would lo all long to have a sustainable agriculture, but to get there, we have to involve all of the people who are working in that agriculture and make our lives rich and full of dignity with everyone treated with respect. It's not just enough to respect the earthworms. We have to love and respect one another. That was well said. Uh, thank you both for your time with us tonight, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, it, again, a wonderful presentation, very informative, speaks to the heart of organic farming. And if you want more information about the Domestic Fair Trade Committee and the upcoming Seed and Grow call, which, as you can see on the screen, will be September 5th, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. to get that call-in number, uh, you can contact Lewis at Lewis at top of the forest dot com and Elizabeth Henderson thirteen at gmail dot com if you want to reach out to Elizabeth Henderson. Um, it as well as if you think about it and you don't have their emails, you can also reach out to me uh, at Anna at nofamass dot dot org. I'd like to take this time to thank everyone for taking time out of out of this very warm and hot. Uh, Tuesday night to share your time with us. We really value your time and appreciate your time with us. Next month we'll be talking about cover cropping, integrating animals on a no-till farm, and that will be done by the executive director of NOFA Mass, Ms. Julie Rawson, one uh, that you definitely want to catch as she talks about the things that they're doing on their farm at Many Hands Farm. Um, I look forward to seeing everyone at our winter conference that's happening in January 2019. We're going back to Worcester State, and you can go directly to our website to see the Save the Date and get more information. So, again, thank you, Lou and Elizabeth, for your time. Thank you to everyone for tuning in and calling in, and I look forward to seeing everyone next month. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.